to the reason we are all here today, which is to hear Professor Jim Shapiro. Professor Shapiro is currently a professor of microbiology in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the Gordon Center for Integrative Science at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1973. A Chicago native who grew up in South Shore, he earned his bachelor's degree in English literature at Harvard before going to Cambridge on a Marshall Scholarship where he earned a PhD in genetics followed by postdoctoral fellowships at the Institut Pasteur in Paris and also at Harvard Medical School. Besides Chicago, he has also taught at the universities of Havana, Tel Aviv, and Edinburgh, and where he has the, um, I'm sorry, where he was the Darwin Prize professor in 1993. He has held numerous fellowships and memberships in scholarly societies, and his many honors include in 2001 being named an honorary officer of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth for services to British American relationships in higher education. His scholarly work is centered on bacterial genetics, and in recent years, his articulation of natural genetic engineering as a driving force of evolutionary change has been called a third way between post-Darwinian orthodoxy and creationism. His publications have included many accessible to the non, to non-specialists among us. And my favorite title of all of these is certainly a 2007 article called Bacteria Are Small But Not Stupid. Please help me welcome Professor James Shapiro on, on uh, revisiting evolution in the 21st century. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Michael for that introduction and the Graham School for inviting me. And after hearing the list of activities for slipping me in amongst all the things that they're doing. And I'd like to thank you, of course, for giving up uh, part of a very fine afternoon uh, to come and talk about uh, evolution. And uh, I, I think this is a, a, an important topic to discuss because the common perception that most people have and certainly the perception one gets if you read the, the, the daily press is that evolution was basically solved. Darwin figured it out in 1859, and really there's nothing more to say about it uh, since then. Um, I want to uh, say that in science, uh, things never work out quite so simply. We're always learning new things. For example, uh, Darwin didn't know anything about genetics uh, or Mendelism, uh, even though Mendel sent him his results, Darwin never read them. Uh, and it was with the rediscovery of Mendelism in 1900 that people began to see that this was a problem for the Darwinian view of evolution until finally in the 1940s uh, came about what is today the reigning view in evolutionary thinking what's called the modern synthesis of Darwinism and Mendelism. Uh, since the modern synthesis was formulated, of course, uh, we learned about DNA. And learning about DNA has opened up a whole world of technology and of uh, um, new approaches to understanding living organisms and living cells, and in particular, their evolution, because we can now trace uh, the history of their DNA through the sequences of their genomes. And uh, this new science, uh, molecular biology in general, and molecular genetics and DNA sequencing in particular, are very important because uh, they constitute what is the essential feature of any science that is an empirical test of the predictions of the theory. And uh, I think you'll see that the results of these empirical tests have been quite literally astonishing and rather different from what uh, the conventional wisdom would have predicted. Uh, now, 
when there are debates about evolution uh, and creationism, intelligent design, and so forth, a number of different issues get mixed in together, and I want to disentangle those from the very uh, beginning. One issue, which is an important one, but I think currently outside of the realm of serious scientific discussion, because we simply do not know enough, is the origin of life and where the first cells came from. I'll have something to say about that later because uh, we recently had a surprise on this front uh, in the 1970s. Uh, the second question is the question which occupied uh, Darwin, uh, occupied its grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, uh, who was really the first Darwin to articulate evolutionary views, and that was the idea that organisms changed over time and that you could have what we call descent with modification, that is, organisms could change and their descendants would continue to inherit the changes, and that different organisms were related to each other. And this is really the crux of evolutionary thinking, and every new technology that is developed simply reinforces this idea that all living organisms are related to each other, that they're capable of changing, and they're capable of passing on those changes. Uh, for example, now that we can sequence DNA and we can sequence proteins, we can make very detailed comparisons and taxonomies of organisms, and we can specify the relationships between them in quite some uh, detail. However, when we do that, we find that the relationships are not as simple as the relationships that were predicted by notions of heredity even as recently as the mid-20th century, which were based strictly on vertical inheritance. That is, you inherited your genetic material strictly from your ancestors uh, and you didn't get anything from the outside. We'll see that that uh, simple view is not uh, the case. Uh, and then the third issue, and the one that I want to discuss most directly, is what are the actual processes of evolutionary change over time? And what I would like to make clear is that through molecular genetics and genome sequencing, we find that we have very good, solid evidence of what some of these molecular events were, what some of the cellular events were, and that these events were fundamentally different from what was predicted by the conventional wisdom, the modern synthesis, at the middle of the 20th century. That's why revisiting evolution in the 21st century is so important. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the novel possibilities we know about in terms of how cells can reorganize their genomes uh, and how cells interact with each other and control the structures of their genomes. Now, uh, again, to address this idea that the basic issues in evolution are solved, uh, certainly if one listens to some people, uh, I won't name names, um, you get the, the idea that basically the, the main questions have been solved. Uh, the, the first question, and the one that I focus on in my own research, uh, is what I think is the most basic question of all, which is where does novelty come from? Uh, 
if there is no novelty, if there is no change, there's nothing for selection to do because it's got no different things to select. And we'll see that novelty is not the accidental random process it was assumed to be, and I want to emphasize assume because this was not based on evidence, but it's actually uh, a very complex series of dedicated biological processes. I see somebody photographing the slides. Uh, I'll post a PDF file of the, the lecture slides on my website so anybody can download it uh, afterwards along with the video. Um, the second uh, point which is far from established and is a, a subject of considerable controversy uh, right now is how does descent with modification occur? Is there simply a tree of life, as Darwin illustrated in the last figure, the only figure in Origin of Species? Or is there something more like a web of life with all kinds of connections between different organisms that were unknown and unsuspected in Darwin's day? Uh, how many cell types were there in the beginning? Was there one or were there more than one? This is a question to which we still don't have the answer. Uh, and uh, another point which is perhaps a little bit technical, but what's the role of the virosphere? What role do viruses and uh, elements like that play and I won't have much to say in this lecture because it's a pretty technical subject, but this was one of the things that I personally didn't pay much attention to until the last two years, and I realize now that there's an enormous amount of activity and interesting work going on in treating uh, viruses as kind of the R&D sector of the evolutionary process. It's where experiments can be done and new things can be worked out before they're actually incorporated into cells. Um, uh, another point is uh, how does heredity work? And how does hereditary change work? Is all hereditary transmission strictly vertical or as I've indicated to you already, is there horizontal transmission between different lines of descent where genetic information may be passed horizontally rather than vertically. And if that's the case, how does that influence the way we think about genome change and evolution and indeed inheritance itself? Are hereditary variations accidents? Are they passive things? Are they mistakes of the replication process? Or are they, in fact, active functions of cells acting to change for uh, particular uh, reasons? Uh, are most mutations small? Are they micro-mutations, as, as Darwin said, uh, small successive changes? Or are there macro-mutations, large changes, as many of the early uh, geneticists and evolutionists maintain? Is the germplasm isolated from the environment as August Weissmann proclaimed at the end of the 19th century? Or in fact, are there means of communication between the life of the organism and the, even the external environment and the genome? Uh, and I'll have something to say about uh, that today. And finally, is Crick's central dogma still valid? Uh, Crick's central dogma was the statement that information flows from DNA through RNA to protein, and it's protein that makes us work and be the way we are. And I've picked on that simply because it is the most specific and precise statement of a, a train of thought which is called genetic determinism. That is that your DNA is your destiny and it, it doesn't matter uh, what you do. Uh, and the DNA is in charge and basically the cell is the slave of the 
the DNA. This is the, the essence of the selfish gene idea of Richard Dawkins. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of biological or biochemical sense. Um, uh, when we'll take a look at that. Natural selection. How does it work? Is it a creative, positive force, as Darwin insisted? Is it a neutral force, as some evolutionists have postulated? Or is it simply a purifying force which gets rid of things that don't work and are misfits, and it essentially has no creative role uh, to play? Is the creative role of natural selection that was postulated a kind of deus ex machina, which uh, really has no solid scientific support. And then finally, how do we relate the change that we see in organisms over the history of the Earth with the many changes that have occurred to the planet, to the environment, and to the ecology? And I'll have a little bit to say about that, although what I'll say is still pretty preliminary, but we're beginning to get a glimpse of how that might work in, in a mechanistic fashion. So I, I want to make five major points. Um, the first point is that the focus in biology has changed from mechanics to informatics. And what I mean about that is, or by that, is that rather than thinking of cells as complex mechanisms that are kind of hardwired to do certain things, we've come to realize that cells are sensitive, they communicate, they process the information, they make decisions, they compute things, uh, it's really a whole different intellectual environment. And this isn't uh, just a personal prejudice of mine. Uh, 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 last month's or the August, I think, issue of the journal Nature, or Nature Immunology, was devoted to decision-making in the immune system. So the idea of cells carrying out this kind of information processing is very widespread and very accepted and puts all of our thinking about biological processes into a, uh, a very different context than the ones in which uh, the 19th century and 20th century evolutionists operated. The second point, and this relates directly to my, my own work, and uh, was first demonstrated by a woman named Barbara McClintock, whom some of you may have heard of, is that hereditary innovation is not accidental. Uh, it's not random. It is actually an active function of cells and that cells generate their own hereditary innovation. And they do this in a large number of different ways, and we'll see examples of these different ways uh, in the course of the lecture. Uh, because, uh, uh, well, point three uh, 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 follows from that, that since genetic change or hereditary innovation is a, an active cellular process like all active cellular processes, it is subject to control. It's not accidental. And what we do need to do is change our thinking about what a genome is. In the conventional view, the genome is a read-only memory that undergoes accidental changes as it is duplicated and passed on to new cells. That's the basic conventional wisdom. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that cells can change their DNA uh, for their own purposes and that the genome is actually a read-write memory system. And 
that that uh, forces us to think about uh, evolution in a different way. The fourth point is that the DNA record tells us that major steps in genome evolution have involved rapid genome-wide changes, and I'll give you some examples of that and how it works. Uh, these possibilities were really ignored by Darwin and his followers. Darwin was a uh, very insistent on small, the accumulation of small changes over long periods of time. Even his friend Thomas Huxley, who Darwin's bulldog, said that the gradualism is not an essential part of the theory, it was the natural selection and he should give up on that. And we'll see that the, the DNA record tells us exactly what kinds of changes can occur. And so finally, the last point is that with the knowledge we have, both from genome sequence analysis and from molecular genetic analysis of cells changing their DNA in real time, we know of molecular processes that allow us to think about complex evolutionary events, and in particular, the rapid evolution of circuits within the genome and within the cell uh, and multi-component adaptations. This is the point that the intelligent design people have been chipping away at, saying Darwinism doesn't explain this. Uh, I think the critique is right. I don't agree with the solution. I don't think we need to invoke the supernatural. And anyway, in science, you never invoke the supernatural. Uh, you always look for the naturalistic explanation. And if we just look at the history of science, we see that things which seem to be supernatural, like the internet or YouTube, uh, they would have seemed supernatural to somebody in the 18th or 19th century, but we know that they're perfectly natural things. So uh, let's talk in a little bit more detail now uh, uh, about cells as sensitive information processing entities. Uh, let's talk about the most important part of life, that is sex. And we'll talk about this character here, the sexually aroused yeast cell. <laughs> this yeast cell has been aroused by the cell below it. Where, where did my cursor go here? Here we go. By this cell here which is producing a pheromone, uh, which is stimulating this cell to grow and lengthen towards this other cell until they can merge and then join their genomes together and form a, a, a diploid cell. It's a very basic biological process. Um, and when we analyze this at the molecular level, we can work out in quite exquisite detail how all of this works. And we know a lot of the players, so we know that the pheromone is a, a certain uh, 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 small protein structure that it's decorated with molecules that are stuck onto it that are important for its action, that within the aroused cell, I'm losing my cursor here again. There is a receptor molecule which sits in the envelope in the ex external surface of the cell. And when it's bound by the pheromone, it undergoes certain biochemical transformations. And then it transmits information in a rather complex form through the cell. And one thing that happens is it activates something called a MAP kinase cascade. We depend upon these cascades. We have many of them. Uh, and that cascade uh, does several things. Uh, one thing it does is it it's transmits information to a whole other circuitry which controls the progress of the yeast cell through the cell cycle. And it stops the cell cycle before the yeast cell can replicate its DNA because for the cells to fuse and form a diploid cell as, as they're going to do, they have to each have only one copy of, of their genome, so they can't replicate their DNA. So the cell cycle machinery is controlled. Uh, another uh, 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 
series of communications activates the transcription factor, something which allows the cell to make all of the proteins it needs for mating. And then finally, a whole different pathway going off here to the side is the one which controls the growth process so the two cells grow into each other and grow towards each other so that they can actually meet and fuse. And this process can be influenced by lots of different factors. It's a very intricate and complicated thing, as you can see, although this is a relatively simple example uh, of what goes on. So cells have these molecular networks and circuitry inside of them, which are analog computational systems that work with uh, amazing efficiency. Uh, Human uh, beings have never created anything as complicated or as reliable as a living cell. So we have a lot to learn about information processing from, from cells. And indeed, a lot of uh, the exciting work in information science is what's called biomimetic. It copies what goes on in living organisms. As far as the central dogma goes, the idea that DNA controls everything, that was articulated by Crick first in 1958 and then in 1970 when it was shown that RNA could be copied back into DNA. And Crick had this idea that DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein, controls phenotype or the properties of the organism. Maybe with an exception here for RNA, this was, a, this was a, a, a simplified idea, and he was very explicit that the foundations of molecular biology would be shaken if it could be shown that proteins could influence RNA or DNA. And uh, 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 a year or two ago, I simply looked at some of what we've learned in the intervening 40 years about information transfer and molecular interactions. And there's a long list here of things which won't mean much to you. But what it basically sell, says is that all kinds of molecules can influence all other kinds of molecules. And that we can't make a Cartesian separation between nucleic acids and the other molecules of the cells. It's the whole cell which indeed processes information and is capable of modifying the structure even of the DNA. So DNA proteins can make new DNA sequences. There are proteins called mutator polymerases which do this. Uh, DNA can acquire new uh, uh, structures based on the action of proteins which can cut and splice the DNA. This is why I call it natural genetic engineering. And we know that even RNA can play a role because RNA can be reverse transcribed into DNA and form new DNA structures. So the cells have lots of ways of changing their DNA. They do do it. And this is often essential for normal life. Uh, we could not survive if our lymphocytes were not capable of cutting and splicing the DNA which is needed to make antibodies. We have to make antibodies to a, a virtually infinite range of invaders, but we only have a finite amount of DNA to encode proteins. So how do we do this? We do this by having a rapid evolution system based upon natural genetic engineering in our immune cells. And they make this tremendous range of, of, of antibodies. So DNA doesn't rule everything. The cell can do things to the DNA. And information transfer is a two-way, probably it's a zillion-way street. And uh, uh, that happens. Now, I want to get into some specifics about evolution and uh, some ideas in evolution and evolutionary change. And 
uh, I thought one of the ways to, 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 to do this and to introduce this is to tell you about some of the scientists who had different ideas. So William Bateson uh, was a British geneticist. He's actually the person who named the science of genetics, genetics. Hugo de Vries was a Dutch botanist. He was one of the three people who rediscovered Mendel's principles in the year 1900, the very start of the 20th century. And both of those were people who said that most variations or the important variations in evolution were abrupt and not slight. Uh, Richard Goldschmidt was uh, a, a famous German Jewish uh, uh, geneticist. He was interested in the relationship between genetics and development. Uh, he was forced to flee Germany and his post in Berlin in the, the late 30s, and he came to uh, Berkeley. Uh, and his point was that altering developmental processes can result in very large changes. And in a way, he anticipated what's now a, a very large field called evo-devo, which is the evolution of developmental processes. And he's the person who coined the term hopeful monsters, that there could be major changes in an organism in its developmental processes, and the organism could have quite new properties which would be useful. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, that term has received a lot of ridicule from conventional evolutionists, but I think people are now beginning to appreciate that Goldschmidt had some uh, solid intuition there. Uh, there is Barbara McClintock, uh, in my view, uh, the greatest biologist of the 20th century. Um, and what uh, Barbara discovered, uh, among other things, was that cells are capable of restructuring and repairing their DNA. And they can do that when there are dangers or challenges to cells, uh, damages to their DNA or other kinds of damage, and they can create new DNA structures which may allow them to survive and proliferate and escape from the danger they find themselves in. She was the only woman uh, to get the Nobel Prize alone in medicine or physiology in 1983. And uh, we'll see later a quote from her Nobel Prize speech. One of the, the, the standard evolutionists of the 20th century was a man called Ledyard Stebbins from Berkeley. Uh, but he's actually uh, uh, a, quite a, a revolutionary figure. In 1951, he published an article in the Scientific American called Cataclysmic Evolution. And he emphasized how hybridization between different species can very rapidly lead to new species. That article was about how a wild uh, uh, wheat-like plant and another plant, I forget what it is now, can hybridize and form a wheat which will produce flour and how that uh, was selected in about 10,000 years ago and how that whole process can be reproduced quite quickly in, in, in the laboratory. So that's uh, one of these rapid change things. Uh, Carl Woese is a scientist at the University of Illinois in Urbana. And he discovered uh, that there's a kind of cellular life that we didn't even know existed before he began his studies trying to use molecular biology as a way of studying evolutionary relationships. And then there's Lynn Margulis, who is a graduate of the lab school in the University of Chicago. Uh, she was at one time Lynn Sagan, married to Carl Sagan. And uh, she showed me the dorm room on 57th Street where Carl would climb out at night when they were undergraduates. And Lynn has been uh, uh, one of the people talking about the role of cell mergers or fusions or symbiosis or what's called symbiogenesis uh, 
as a source of evolutionary novelty. And this is another form of rapid change, which has been quite important. So uh, what we know from uh, uh, the, the looking at the DNA record is that there are four kinds of rapid changes which affect multiple characters that Darwin could not possibly have imagined. Uh, one is that DNA transfers horizontally between different lineages in evolution. Secondly, that there are multiple cell types and that these different cell types can fuse together and create totally new cells and new organisms, and that that's a very important part of evolution. Third, that uh, at certain key stages in evolution, the whole genome doubles, and that this is a critical multi-character rapid change that occurs during evolution. And these are all things that are very well documented in the DNA record. And finally, um, as McClintock was the first to show, cells have lots of mechanisms that are built into them to restructure their genomes, these natural genetic engineering processes, which allow them to rearrange the DNA and create novelty and create new systems which can lead to new phenotypic characters. Uh, and uh, the, the best example of how this change came about is through the, uh, 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 a worldwide evolution experiment that we began after World War II when we started the mass use of antibiotics. Um, when I was a, 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 an undergraduate uh, and in high school, there was a conventional theory of how antibiotic resistance would arise, and that is that the cells, the bacterial cells would suffer mutations. The mutations would change the structure of the cells in ways, and that would make them maybe less sensitive to the antibiotics or less permeable to the antibiotics. And if you accumulated enough of these changes, you would get high levels of antibiotic resistance. And this theory was consistent with prevailing views. And not only that, you could actually demonstrate this process in the laboratory. You could select the mutants. You could select successive mutations, and you could achieve high levels of antibiotic resistance. The only thing wrong with this logically consistent experimentally verified theory is that it didn't occur in the real world. When people began to examine the bacteria that in, were found to be resistant in clinical settings, and in particular the Japanese were pioneers in this, they found that they didn't become resistant by mutation they became resistant because they acquired new DNA molecules from other organisms, and the DNA molecules gave them the capability of degrading or excluding or pumping out the antibiotics. So this is uh, uh, a view, a cartoon of what might be happening, a sensitive cell comes along and the member of the antibiotic resistance, I guess something like the French resistance, that's why he has a trench coat on, uh, says, kid, want to be a super bug, stick some of this into your genome and even penicillin won't be able to harm you because the segment of DNA could encode an enzyme, a penicillinase, which would inactivate the penicillin. And this is a slide simply showing that we know lots of different ways that DNA gets transferred back and forth horizontally between different bacterial cells and different species of bacteria. There are what are called conjugation mechanisms where cells join together and transfer DNA. There are transduction mechanisms where 
uh, viral particles pick up DNA from one cell and transfer it to another, sometimes related but not always necessarily. And finally, there are cases where cells die and liberate free DNA into the environment and that DNA is then picked up, incorporated by a cell and it incorporates the information that's in that DNA. That's the process called transformation which was actually first discovered in 1928, uh, interestingly enough. And it was the study of transformation which led Oswald Avery and his colleagues at the Rockefeller Institute to demonstrate that DNA carried inherited information in the 1940s. Once this extra information is picked up, uh, the uh, DNA can encode uh, enzymes which degrade antibiotics, uh, which modify them chemically and inactivate them, which pump the antibiotics out of the cell, as shown here, an efflux pump. Efflux is a kind of fancy word that scientists use for out. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, 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 the mechanisms even modify molecules in the cell so that they're no longer sensitive to the anti. Uh, biotic. So uh, there are a lot of ways of doing this, but the basic principle is that DNA is transferred horizontally, and as that happens, new biochemical and capabilities are acquired, and these can be rather complicated. So it doesn't have to just go in small steps. So that's point one about horizontal transfer. We now know that this is fundamental to how uh, uh, simple cells uh, evolve and it's also true of higher cells and I need to say something now about uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes because in the 20th century and actually even at the end of the 19th century through microscopy it became clear that there were two kinds of living cells there were the things that make us up and make up plants and uh, our big cells. Those are the ones shown on the right here, which are eukaryotic cells. And eukaryote means true kernel. They had a true nucleus, which was well-defined by a nuclear membrane, and that contained the chromosomes, which it was learned uh, largely through the work of Barbara McClintock uh, were the carriers of genetic information. Um, and they have all of these other organelles in them that are shown there. They have mitochondria and centrioles and things called the Golgi apparatus and an endoplasmic reticulum. They have lots of structure that you can see in the microscope. And then there were these small cells which had no visible nucleus. So they're called prokaryote before nucleus, and they're smaller, and in the light microscope you couldn't see much structure. We're learning now that they actually have a lot of structure too. It's just a lot smaller and a lot harder to see. And originally it was thought that the prokaryotes were basically bacteria, and all prokaryotes were uh, similar to each other, uh, and that they were considered to be the, the smallest, most primitive cells. They're small, and therefore they were thought to be stupid. That's why I used that phrase in the title to my article. And uh, were thought to be rather primitive. And we do indeed still think that prokaryotes preceded eukaryotes in the, his, in the evolution of the history uh, uh, of life. Now, the, the history of life idea, uh, the, the tree of life idea, is that there was an original cell which then diversified and branched out. Here it is exemplified on the left in a, a letter from Darwin to his friend the botanist Joseph Hooker in 1844. But here's an, uh, 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 a picture from uh, an article by Carl Woese in Scientific American uh, on archaebacteria, and I'll explain what those are in just a second, which gives a more complicated picture, a kind of branching tree from some ancestral cell. Uh, 
and then some kinds of mergers which bring things together to produce other new kinds of cells. So it isn't just a branching process. There can be fusions and, and joinings. And um, uh, uh, the picture got to be more complicated when Woes set out to do uh, a strictly molecular form of taxonomy. He didn't want to use visible characteristics. He wanted to use molecules as his way of inferring what the relationships were, were between organisms. And he chose the molecule which is shown here on the right. It's the 16S ribosomal RNA in bacteria. It's 18S, a little bit larger in eukaryotes. It is a highly conserved, highly important functional part of a structure called the ribosome, which is required to translate the nucleic acid sequence information in RNA into the peptide sequence information of protein. So this is very fundamental for all living cells. And Woe's uh, sequenced lots and lots of RNAs from uh, different organisms. And what he found was not that there are two kinds of life, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but that the prokaryotes actually separated into two different groups. One group he called bacteria. It includes the bacteria that we're all familiar with, like salmonella, uh, uh, harmful bacteria, rhizobium, the one that makes, fixes nitrogen and root nodules, a friendly bacterium. And they're all over here. But there's a totally separate group which included organisms that at the time were isolated from unusual environments, hot springs in Yellowstone, deep sea vents and so forth. And they thought that maybe they were the oldest cells, so they were called archaea to indicate that they were old. But in fact, we now know that archaea are distributed everywhere just as bacteria are. And these two types of prokaryotes were as different from each other as they were from the eukarya, the eukaryotes, which is a single group. Now, this was a, a, a really uh, surprising and controversial discovery. In, it wasn't until the mid-1970s, and it wasn't widely accepted until at least 10 years later that there was, in fact, an extra kind of cell out there in the environment. We did not know until the 1970s that there were three kinds of cells. And what, that's extremely important because it means, among other things, we don't know how many kinds of cells there were in the early history of the Earth. They're not going to leave any fossils. There could have been many kinds of cells and they could have gone extinct, and we wouldn't know about it, but they may have contributed in important ways to the evolution of life. And indeed, there are people who are trying to do very sophisticated kinds of analysis to, to see if they can figure that out. The other thing is that all the eukaryotes are related to each other, and you can't read this table on the left here, but it has three columns. It has archaea bacteria, eubacteria, or, or archaea and bacteria, and then eukaryotes. And it has a whole series of different characteristics of cells. And what's interesting about this is that in virtually all of these characteristics, two of the cell types are similar to each other and different from the third. But it's not always the same two that are similar. So in some characteristics, the eukaryotes are different from both archaea and bacteria. But in many characteristics, they're similar to bacteria. And in a whole other set of characteristics, they're similar to archaea. And I think it's now pretty widely agreed that eukaryotes evolved at some critical point in evolutionary history from some kind of interaction and merger between archaea
and bacteria. And uh, the uh, uh, relationships between the cell types is illustrated in this more recent uh, 2000 article from Ford Doolittle in Scientific American showing this sort of branching, joining web of life which has now become very popular amongst uh, many of the uh, uh, evolutionists uh, and tells us that the history of life is a much more complicated process than could have been imagined in the 19th or even uh, indeed in the 20th century. Now, we know that eukaryotic cells came from cell mergers. And uh, I've got to trouble you with a little bit of technical detail to get this story uh, across. On the left is a kind of cartoon of a eukaryotic cell. Uh, and it's a photosynthetic cell. And in particular, it has two kinds of organelles uh, which are critical. One, it, and sh that's shown in an electron microscope picture on the lower right, is the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion carries out the oxidative metabolism of the cell. And it turns out that the mitochondria have their own DNA and their own ribosomes. And the DNA and the ribosomes tell us that these are bacteria. They are endosymbiotic bacteria. So at some point in the history of eukaryotic cells, since virtually all of them have mitochondria or degenerate mitochondria, that bacteria came to live within the eukaryotic cell. And that's a big change. The top picture shows a chloroplast, which is the photosynthetic organelle, which produces oxygen. And the chloroplast also has its own DNA and its own ribosomes. And they tell us that this is a cyanobacterium, but a blue-green photosynthetic oxygen-producing bacterium. So in all photosynthetic higher organisms, photosynthesis is actually carried out by endosymbiotic bacteria. So there's absolutely no argument about this in the scientific community. It's clear that these two symbiotic events were critical in the history of the formation of all higher organisms. And that's symbolized in this figure here. Uh, if I can find the cursor, I can point out to you here. Here is the formation of the original precursor of the eukaryotes, which has picked up a mitochondrion. It may have picked up other things as well, we don't know how many cells were involved, but at least the uh, bacteria which became the mitochondrion was involved. And that is an ancestor of all of the eukaryotic cells. We don't think this happened more than one time, but of course that's always possible. Down here at the bottom is an event where a cell picked up a cyanobacteria to make a chloroplast, or what's more generally called a plastid, and create photosynthetic cells, which include plants, of course, green algae, and red algae. But what you see here are these uh, lines which indicate secondary symbioses, where algae become symbiotic in a non-photosynthetic eukaryote and create a whole new kind of eukaryote which is photosynthetic. So we have symbioses and then symbioses within symbioses and we have cells which have four distinct DNA compartments. They have a mitochondrion, they have a plastid, they have a nucleus, and they have what's called a nucleomorph when an algae has become part of another cell. And we know from where the DNA is located that there have been transfers back and forth, typically from these organelles, into the nuclear genome because the nucleus encodes most of the proteins that are present in these uh, organelles. So this is probably, these are probably the two single most important steps in all of evolution. 
and they are cell mergers, they are abrupt, multi-character changes, and uh, clearly they are distinct from what traditional evolutionary theory teaches. Now, let's go on to uh, uh, hybridization and, and genome doubling, and let's look at Ledyard Stebbings. There's a, a nice photo of him. There's a link to his website. And he studied mustards of the family Brassica, and he was able to show that certain mustards were hybrids, were fusions of two other mustards. So Brassica carinata, which is Ethiopian mustard, is actually a fusion between wild cabbage, Brassica oleracea, and Brassica nigra. And Brassica juncia, mustard greens, which I think many of us eat, I hope many of us eat them because they're good for you, all right, is a fusion between Brassica nigra and Brassica rapa, which is a turnip mustard. And then uh, rapeseed, or what we call um, uh, a canola, oil, canola for making oil, is a fusion between these two brassicas, and it has doubled the chromosome numbers. So evolution can occur very rapidly when two different species merge together. And that's well established. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, almost all of plant evolution involves fusions and doublings of genomes. Uh, Darwin wrote a letter to Hooker in, 19, in 1837 calling the rapid diversification of flowering plants in the fossil record an abominable mystery. And the reason he found it abominable was he couldn't think of how it could happen. But of course, he didn't know about chromosomes. He didn't know about hybridization. And now that we know about them and that we can actually reproduce this in the laboratory or in the field, uh, it's not so abominable anymore. It's something that goes on all the time. And it actually is very important in our own history. So in 1970, uh, uh, an evolutionist called Susumu Ono, who worked in the University of California, uh, I think it was Davis, but I'm not sure, wrote a book about duplications in evolution. And he said that it's, at certain periods, whole genomes duplicate, and that in the history of the vertebrates, there must have been two whole genome duplications. And we now know that this is the case and that when the vertebrates separated from the chordates, chordates have a, 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 a nerve cord in the back like we do, but they don't have a skeleton, everything that has a skeleton has doubled its chromosomes. And then when jawed vertebrates separated from vertebrates that had uh, uh, non, didn't have jaws, hagfish and lampreys, there was another genome duplication. So the, the genome has now gone up four times in size and has changed. And if we look at many of the bony fish, they've undergone yet another duplication. And what's not shown on here is if you look at salmon and trout, they've undergone yet another duplication. So they've undergone a 16-fold amplification of their genome. And then after these duplications, things are lost and the genome reduces in size. But this is a very rapid change. And what's critical about these duplications in evolution, let me just go to the next slide. Yeah, let me go back. Is that very complex systems that have been set up in the genome, which encode complex processes like the development of a limb or something like that, they are duplicated. And the new organism now has two copies of them. So it can still carry out the old job, but it's got another copy of the circuitry to modify to do some new kind of job, like change a leg into a wing, for example. And these things have happened repeatedly in evolution, and they happen because the cells are capable of rearranging and restructuring their genomes. And this, we, our understanding of this, we owe uh, in the first instance to Barbara McClintock, who studied maize 
she was one of the pioneers of the science called cytogenetics, where she could correlate chromosome structure that you could see in the microscope with genetics. And in, in the 1930s, she was studying why did X-ray cause mutations? And she figured out that X-rays broke chromosomes, and then sometimes the ends joined end to end in a way that they hadn't been joined together originally. And that's what it says here. If chromosomes are broken by various means, the broken ends appear to be adhesive and tend to fuse with one another two by two. In other words, cells could take broken ends of chromosomes, bring them together, and seal them and repair them. The idea that cells could restructure their genomes and repair their genomes was unknown before McClintock work this out. And that capacity is absolutely critical and revolutionary in our understanding of how genetic change occurs. Because if cells can do that, then they can do lots of different things. Later on, she discovered that uh, pieces of DNA could hop around and change, uh, and that these processes were regulated. These four photos here simply show maize kernels undergoing the same chromosome breaks, but in the top two cases, they occur very early in development. In the bottom two cases, they occur very late in development and, and, and more rarely. And this shows that this process was subject to some kind of control. And she discovered uh, the fact that DNA could move around by forcing cells to break their chromosomes through some clever uh, genetic manipulations. And uh, she pointed out that what this meant was that uh, the, the cell could sense that something was going wrong, could activate these pieces of DNA, and use them to repair the damage. And so what she said was in her Nobel Prize speech, which, by the way, doesn't say anything about the mechanisms for which she was awarded the prize. She was looking to the future and not to the past. She says, in the future, attention undoubtedly will be centered on the genome. That's not certainly true. With greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive organ of the cell, and the cell monitors genomic activities and corrects common errors, senses unusual and unexpected events, and responds to them often by restructuring the genome. And uh, this is where my work uh, intersected with hers. Uh, I just want to show one example of how a cell uh, is sensitive to uh, changes, and this is E. coli, one of these small but not stupid bacteria. And on the left here is an illustration of the genetic uh, rearrangement which I was working with. Uh, there is a piece of DNA which allows the cell to use arabinose, a piece of DNA which allows the cell to use lactose. Neither is active because they're interrupted. In between them is a piece of DNA, which is one of these things that can move around and restructure the genome. And if this piece of DNA does the right set of steps, and it's a pretty complicated process, you get a, a, a genetic fusion between the arabinose and lactose encoding DNA, and the cell can grow on a mixture of arabinose plus lactose. And so that's the experiment I did. And I took this cell and plated it out. I grew it up and plated it out. And for the first five days on the Petri dishes, there were no colonies. So what that said was when this cell was growing normally, it never made any of these rearrangements. But after five days, all of a sudden, colonies would start to appear. And what you would see is the number of colonies would invariably go up and by the end of a week or two, every plate would be full of colonies. It would be like acne had broken out in the most severe case, or maybe chickenpox or something like that. And the cells had been triggered to form these rearrangements by the starvation. 
And then it was possible to show by genetics that if you had a mutant which lacked one of the critical proteins needed for rearrangements of this, that the fusions were not formed. So this was a biologically controlled biochemical process where the cells responded to starvation and changed the frequency of genome restructuring, uh, in this case by over five orders of magnitude or over 100,000 fold. That's a pretty dramatic uh, effect. So uh, it turns out that there are lots of different stimuli which can trigger cells to turn on these natural genetic engineering activities. Chromosome breaks, cell signaling molecules, starvation, DNA damage, loss of telomeres, antibiotics, oxidants, pressure. Uh, I didn't include sending into space, but that hurt, uh, works too. Growing cells in tissue culture, and in particular, infections or symbiotic rearrangements, changes in the ploidy, that is, in the content of the genome, genome doubling, destabilizes things and leads to rearrangements, and interspecific hybridization, precisely the sorts of processes that Stebbins and other plant geneticists had studied. So uh, genome change is a regulated process that is triggered by certain kinds of, of, of events. Now, let me just make a few points, and then I'm just about at the end. I don't know how, how I've, I've run over a little bit. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, first of all, uh, this process of natural genetic engineering, of taking the DNA, sometimes doubling it, rearranging it, and so forth, this is actually a much better way of creating novelty than making small changes and accumulating them by time. So one of the things is that what you're doing is you use what is combinatorics, that is you're taking segments of DNA which already encode molecules that do something and rearranging them and putting them into new combinations. That's much more likely to give you a novel activity or a novel function than changing an existing function one little bit at a time. Generally that will degrade function. Secondly, these activities, as I just explained, can be turned off and turned on, and they can be turned on when they are most biologically useful, when what has occurred, what McClintock called a genome shock, and in particular, starvation, infection, and hybridization can lead not only to individual changes, but by activating these systems can lead to multiple changes which are in not independent of each other, so you can get massive changes in genome structure, and indeed we can see some of this uh, in uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, after a genome has doubled uh, following hybridization, uh, it's possible to establish new networks carrying out complicated uh, uh, new tasks, which is what happens when you see a new morphology or a new function or a new adaptation appear in evolution. And finally, something I didn't talk about is that these changes are not random and indeed can be directed to specific places in the genome by well-established molecular mechanisms so that the potential is there. It remains yet to be demonstrated for a more heuristic process of genome reorganization, not just mixing, but mixing and putting related things together in new combinations, which may uh, further accelerate the process. So how do we think about evolution or how can we think about evolution in the 21st century? And we're just at the beginning of the century, so obviously what we're going to propose now is going to appear pretty naive by the end of the century. But uh, I think the first thing is to think about what happens when there's a major ecological disruption, like when an asteroid hits the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, which is what wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, the biota, the, uh, the uh, 
constellation of living organisms changes dramatically and it's depleted. Food sources change. Um, and so uh, the adaptive needs of organisms and their behavior are going to change. Well, how are they going to change? Among other things, they're going to undergo cell fusions. They're going to undergo interspecific hybridizations. We know, for example, that, that uh, uh, wasps and butterflies can be tricked into mating with orchids, but not once they've seen a real female. But if you can't find the right female, and the urge to mate is strong enough, you'll find the closest thing you can. And if that's of a different species, you may make something new. So when there are these disruptions, we can expect uh, uh, episodes of horizontal transfer and genome rearrangements to follow as a consequence of them. And that means that there will be new cell and genome system architectures formed and complex new adaptations will arise. And indeed, we know that following mass extinctions in the fossil record, there is a relatively rapid increase of what are called originations or appearance of new species in the fossil record. And as this is going on, those organisms where the rearrangements and changes have proven useful will survive and begin to adapt to the new environment and the organisms where the changes are not useful will be eliminated. So uh, I think selection is not going to be a creative force, but it's going to be a purifying force. It's going to get rid of the misfits. And finally, once all of this has happened and the environment, the new environment is filled up, then evolution by small changes, what we call microevolution, can take place and fine tune uh, the novelties. So I think that's a very different way of thinking about evolution than traditionally. It's backed by a lot of hard science and uh, I think I should stop here. Thank you for your patience. You've got, absorbed an awful lot of information in a very short time. Yes, I'm supposed to take questions. In fact, I'm eager to take questions. You said that the organisms, the uh, mitochondria and the telegraph um, ancestor prokaryotes had only entered the eukaryotic cells at one time in the past. I don't understand why they didn't. They could only happen once. That's why you're saying this. But why did they only happen once? Um, well, uh, uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, uh, transmitting is the conventional wisdom. This isn't my area of expertise. There's no reason it had to happen once. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, forgive me. Forgive me, yes. The, the question was, I said that uh, it looked like the mitochondrion endosymbiotic bacteria came into the uh, original eukaryotic cell once. Uh, and, and that's simply on the basis that all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria or their descendants. Uh, at least that's what one camp claims. There are other camps. Uh, and uh, that all photosynthetic organisms also descended from a single uh, endosymbiotic event. There, there may be DNA sequence evidence which indicates that that's the case, that it, it was the same uh, organism. But uh, that's the conventional view. It is not excluded that these ha things happen more than once. And of course, we have no trace of those episodes where things like that happened, but then went extinct. Because this was all long before there were organisms which had shells and left tracks that we could really uh, uh, look at. So. That's the conventional wisdom, as in everything, uh, I'm sure we're going to be up for some pretty astonishing surprises. Uh, they keep coming. Every, every year there's something new and surprising. Wow, I never thought that that could happen. <laughs>
or something that we were taught couldn't happen does happen. Uh, uh, my whole career, uh, actually, in, in doing genetics with bacteria, I was very lucky to do a BA in English since I didn't get taught what I shouldn't think. And the bacteria I was working with kept doing things that people had said they're not supposed to do. Um, that's one of the reasons that I tend to like to think about how do we, what are alternative ways we can think about some of these problems rather than stick with the conventional wisdom. So uh, I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah. In, Well, uh, 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 let me take the question was, it's one thing to say that cells have the capability of restructuring their DNA. Let me, let me plug this back in and get something back up on the screen so we have a little more light. Um, and it's another thing to say that they're activated at the right time uh, to do something useful. Uh, you, you left out of the question uh, the, the idea of where do they work? Do they work at a specific place or do they not work at a specific place? Uh, I think this is an area that we need to explore. W once, of course, the appropriate change has been made and the bacteria or the organism can grow and flourish in its new environment, it doesn't have to undergo any changes of the same kind because it's got the change it needs and it, it's proliferating. But the, the, the evidence, and the evidence is quite extensive and quite detailed, is that uh, all of these systems which rearrange the genome are controlled. We know a great deal about how they're controlled, uh, not exhaustively, uh, but we know a lot, uh, and we know experimentally uh, what kind of processes will trigger them to operate at higher levels. And I, I showed you a, a, a list of, of the uh, stresses or the challenges that would, would do that. So that's all very well established. Now, uh, how many of the changes that are formed actually are successful and useful, we don't know. What we do know is that uh, these changes don't just occur willy-nilly or uniformly through the DNA. There are lots and lots of different kinds of specificities. They have different kinds of molecular mechanisms. We know in dedicated systems like the immune system, that the specificities are quite important, they're functional, they're useful, they dramatically enhance the probability of getting uh, a useful product out, uh, and they're still consistent with the enormous variability that is, is needed. Uh, I could have given a whole lecture about the immune system, but I think it wouldn't have been quite as accessible as, as, as this. So, I, uh, all I need to say is I think that exploring the role of control, of turning things on and off, and also of directing processes to specific regions of the genome is part of the research agenda for the 21st century. Um, a lot of things, it's again one of those things that we were told wasn't possible. Uh, it's not possible to just cut the DNA at certain places.
In fact, this goes on all of the time in your lymphocytes, and thank God that it does because otherwise you'd have uh, uh, severe immunodeficiency and probably wouldn't be here today. So there was a gentleman in the red shirt behind you had a question. Yes. Well, uh, uh, you, you, you've touched on a very sensitive subject. The question is, do the quantum scientists talk to the biologists uh, about these things? Uh, first of all, most of the biologists don't talk to each other uh, 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 about this. Uh, certainly, I think there are very few of my colleagues who would endorse what I'm saying, uh, even though everything I've said is, uh, is, is based upon uh, solid empirical evidence. Um, I, I tried to make a dialogue, not with the quantum physicists, but with the condensed matter physicists, because they're interested in polymers and things like that. It, it was a failure. Uh, because we didn't have a common language and there are lots of places where it would be useful. However, the funding situation is driving many of the PhDs in the physical sciences to do biologically related subjects. And that's happened before. Molecular biology was stimulated by the entrance of Max Delbruck, uh, who was a uh, 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 a nuclear physicist into the field, or Morris Wilkins and, and the science of crystallography, indeed. So uh, this is having a tremendous stimulatory effect, and it has a stimulatory effect in two ways. One is that these people bring with them techniques and mathematical and analytical sophistication which the biologists lack and which is extremely useful. The other thing is that they haven't been taught what not to think. And so they are able to come up with original and novel ideas, which are harder for the people who were trained as, uh, as biologists. And it's already been extremely useful. They're still fixated on certain ideas which they carry over from physics that are as much outmoded as some of the ideas that we have from conventional evolutionary theory. Um, but young people will do new things and discover lots of interesting stuff. So I think, yes, uh, there, there was an idea that you can somehow formalize this process. I don't think you can. I think it just has to happen ser serendipitously. And um, it, it will. I should say, by the way, that as a Cambridge man, I, I think that what goes on in Cambridge is admirable and well to be um, uh, followed at the University of Chicago. It's very hard, though, to convince people at the University of Chicago that they should follow anybody. Uh, so, yes, young lady. I, you'll have to speak a little bit louder. I have trouble hearing. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, the, the, it, I think these weren't uh, cells. These were plants. They were put into a, a rocket and then recovered. And then they were examined genetically and at the DNA level, and they were found to show a much higher level of variability than the control plants which didn't go into space. Now, what part of the space experience it was that was responsible, I don't think we know.
And it's a pretty complicated process going into a rocket and uh, being shot off. So uh, I don't know. And those are expensive experiments to perform. So with all the budget uh, concerns that people have, we probably won't follow up on that too much. A lot of the other things we can follow up on, and we're actually, uh, we have some uh, very interesting and detailed ideas about what it is that's being affected by some of these uh, stresses. But I have to emphasize again, it's that process of the cell picking up information, picking up signals, monitoring its own internal processes, and then processing that information through the molecular networks, which lead to changes in such things as the controls that exist over the biochemistry that rearranges the DNA. Okay, I hope, I hope I've answered that. There's a question way at the back there. Uh, the, question, the question is, if Darwin had actually opened the, the manuscript that Mendel sent him and read it, would it have been significant? I, my, my own feeling is no. Darwin was very influenced by uh, some ideas that he uh, learned very early on, uh, especially from Lyle, his geology professor in Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, even when people like, as I said, like Huxley would argue with him about some of these things, he, he would keep to his original views. So I, I think he, he probably wouldn't have recognized what was so important. And indeed, I, I think it, was, it, was, it took about 20 or 30 years for people to be able to put a lot of that stuff together and understand what the basis of Mendelian segregation was, what it meant, and how that related to uh, the process of inheritance and, and genome restructuring. Uh, we're still working on that. So I suspect no, that, that, that Darwin was a man of, of pretty fixed uh, ideas, uh, although some of them would surprise some people. There was a paper published recently, Darwin's last book, which was on the power of movement in plants, and he talks about the tip of the root as being the brain of the plant. And um, again, uh, this idea of sensitivity and, and responsiveness in living organisms, which Darwin as a naturalist himself uh, appreciated. Um, I think most people, if you tell them that, they, they, would, they would find it hard to believe. But it is true. Yes, sir. Well, uh, uh, Lysenko is a criminal, uh, although he was right about vernalization. And uh, we now understand that as an epigenetic phenomenon controlled by exposure to the cold. Uh, Lamarck uh, was a person who was very observant said a lot of things that were quite interesting and true, was certainly uh, an earlier advocate of evolutionary change than Darwin. But Lamarck suffered from being a French nobleman. <laughs> and, and well, no, I don't, think, I don't think he got his head chopped off, I'm not sure, but uh, what I meant by that was that he believed in certain ideas and in the purity of certain ideas. And so he pushed them uh, uh, irresponsibly. Now, most of the people who criticize Lamarck, of course, have never read him. Uh, Lamarck is coming back into fashion, and uh, people are understanding epigenetic phenomena, which I noticed was on the cover of Time some months ago, uh, as a, a kind of Lamarckian-type phenomenon. So uh, uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, what I'm talking about is something that Lamarck himself could not have imagined, even though he said a lot of useful things. For example, the importance of hybridization 
in evolution that were different from uh, that. And it's also, of course, gotten to be a nationalistic thing. Lamarck is viewed much more favorably on the continent and in France than he is in the United Kingdom, where uh, their boy uh, got it right and the French boy got it wrong. Yes. Well, the, the interesting thing about the atom bomb studies, and, they, and, they, and the populations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were followed very carefully, um, is that there was not a lot of inherited change in the, in the children of the survivors. There were lots and lots of tumors and lots of cancer that resulted from the bombing and from exposure to radiation. But uh, the germ cells were capable of a lot of repair. And uh, I think, now I, I could be wrong about this, but my recollection is that the evidence was that there was actually very little increase in the incidence of uh, uh, identifiable mutations in, in the offspring of the survivors. Well, I, 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 I don't, that's not completely correct. What you're referring to, the, the, the question is why did all of the basic body plans arise in a small window of time and evolution? And I think what you're referring to is the Cretaceous, uh, the, um, the Cambrian explosion, when the change from the Devonian period to the Cambrian period, when all of a sudden all of the existing phyla of bilaterally symmetrical animals appeared suddenly in the, in the fossil record. There are, of course, non-bilaterally symmetrical body plans, which appeared at different periods in the evolutionary record and are older, and some may be newer. I'm not an expert on this. So it, that was the, the one group which radiated quite suddenly. I, 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 I think the reason for that is that the mass extinction at the end of the Ediacaran period presented the opportunity for exactly the kind of massive change in diversification I'm talking about. And the fundamental toolkit for the bilateral body plan, in particular the Hox complex, already existed when this opportunity presented itself. So I think uh, the kind of scheme that I'm talking about would predict that you would get fits and starts and that uh, punctuated equilibrium or episodic evolution rather than continuous evolution is what you would expect. I think there was somebody else who hadn't asked a question yet. Yes. Well, uh, uh, all big organisms are made of cells. Um, they have to develop from uh, a, a single symbiogenic event, which is called fertilization. Cell fusions are absolutely essential to advanced life as we know it. We shouldn't think of those as exceptions. Every fertilization event is a cell fusion. Uh, the cell has to contain the information it needs to develop into a particular kind of organism. And uh, um, the, you're asking me to get into the question of, of developmental biology and the role of cell heredity in developmental biology, which is a little complicated. It, it is. The, the changes that are going to be important 
in evolution have to occur in the germ cells because they need to get passed on to future generations. There are lots of ways that can happen and does happen. And indeed, many of these systems which we know that restructure the genome are limited to action within the germline, which is an interesting uh, point. But uh, the cells have to contain the information needed for multicellular morphogenesis. And then the, as the cells grow and proliferate, they have to differentiate and communicate with each other to make a larger organism. That is this whole area that's covered by Evo Devo and by studying development. It's quite a fascinating process. But in the end, it comes down to uh, um, the systems that are already usable that are in the genome. Uh, now, there are, of course, many organisms or, or, uh, that, that actually have are, are more than one organism. Think about a butterfly. It's a butterfly, but it's also a caterpillar, and they're not the same thing. And yet, that, th those two organisms interconvert, and they all come from the same fertilization event. So uh, tracing from the fertilized cell through the caterpillar to the butterfly and then back to another fertilization event is a very intricate and fascinating process. But the fundamental basis is we have to understand it in terms of cells, cell interactions, and cell heredity. I, I think that's the most uh, specific answer I can give you right now. We'd have to go into uh, a great deal of tedious uh, detail to, to go beyond that. So I hope that's satisfactory. Okay. All right. Well, I think that everybody has been more than patient enough. Thank you.